As you can tell from your bulletin, the subject we're going to look at this afternoon is the Holy Spirit's ministry to Jesus. If I have uh, any weakness on this subject matter, I can only blame myself. I chose this. It was not assigned to me, but uh, Michael will bear me witness. I chose it because I wanted something that I had never considered before. Uh, the, some of the subjects that are in this I've preached on, and I was afraid that I would just dip into the barrel and preach the things I've already preached once before, and that it wouldn't have the vitality that it needs to have at this occasion. So over the past several months, I have had many occasions to wonder if that was a good idea or not, as I look at the issue of the Holy Spirit's ministry to Jesus. Uh, many of the topics that are in the bulletin, you'll notice uh, there's a scripture reference with them, at least that jumps right to mind. Uh, like the fruit of the Spirit, it says that, Galatians 5, you know where that is. How about this one? If you have some that jumped to your mind, where were you two months ago? You should have been calling me and telling me, this is what your subject is, this is the verses you need to use. Let me share with you some of the difficulties associated with this subject. First of all, there is the apparent pointlessness of the subject to the common man in the church. People will look at this and say, this seems uh, incredibly esoteric, uh, thoroughly unpractical. Why would you focus on anything like this? Does the Bible even really talk about that or talk like that? And so the average person probably looks at that subject and says, well, it's a preacher's meeting. They'll talk about those kind of things. I trust that this does not describe you right now, and I hope that if it does, that it does not describe your feelings on this when I'm finished. Second, there is the difficulty of distinguishing between Bible references uh, to the following. And some of you other speakers I know will, will amen on this uh, uh, along with me. The difficulty of capital S spirit versus lowercase s spirit. Is it referring to the spirit of a man? that we are body, soul, and spirit? Is it referring to uh, spirit as in a demonic being, which is also used that way in scripture? Is it referring to the, the spirit, uh, somebody sees uh, what they think is a ghost, and they'll use the word spirit. Is the word referring to the general tone or flavor or atmosphere of a group or time period, the uh, uh, spirit of unbelief that was among the people? Is it being referred to that way? Is it referring to a particular uh, spiritual being? Like, for example, spirit of unbelief. Is that a particular entity? I don't think so. I think he's using the word differently. But as you know from Brother Phil's message that was before this, that uh, the word uh, spirit, uh, the word behind it is translated many different ways. And that's why there's that play upon it in John 3, where he talks about the, the breath and the wind and the blowing. And there's the word for spirit all the way through there in different forms. So there's some difficulty there, especially when you're looking at this subject matter. Uh, especially when you consider that that. Our Bible might have capital S spirit, but when it came from the pen of the author, it was all capitals. They didn't make those kind of distinctions. There weren't even spaces between the words when they would write in the columns. Uh, so there is a third difficulty as well. Distinguish for me, please, the difference between the Holy, Holy Spirit's ministry from Jesus or through Jesus versus the Holy Spirit's ministry to Jesus. I'd be coming along and think I found a great verse. All right, this is going to describe the Holy Spirit's ministry to Jesus. And then I would look at it and realize it's telling me a lot more about what the Holy Spirit is doing through Jesus than to Jesus or on Jesus' behalf. So that's something to, to consider. And finally, I think there are many preconceived notions about Jesus that we carry around. Uh, notions that are, in fact, not precisely biblical. Uh, for example, let me remind you that your view of Jesus has to include the truth of this following reference, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Did you know Jesus had to learn? Or does your view of Jesus have him as somehow complete already as a child? And he merely has to let his chronological age catch up to his intellectual or spiritual age. It says here, he learned. He learned. Verse 9 right after it says, Being made perfect, after being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. 
Do you realize the implication with that is that he was not yet perfect as a Savior before that? And the word perfect is not flawless. They don't mean it that way. But complete, whole, ready, able to be offered as our Savior. If as the boy in the temple at age 12, if there had been some horrible ox cart accident in the city and he would have been killed, it would not have been for our sins. He was not yet perfect, having gone through the things which he suffered. In this we see that Jesus did not arrive fully mature, fully complete as our Savior. There was, and that's God ordained, that was not a surprise, but there had to be a period of time and development. Uh, contrast that to the first Adam. The first Adam that when you read of his creation, he's mature. He's full grown. He's not a boy. Whereas Jesus, the second Adam, he comes through the whole process of uh, conception, of fetal development, of full birth, of growth. His voice had to change and his voice probably cracked. Is that okay with you? Does that fit into your view of Jesus? Those things are not sin though they might be embarrassing to those of us that have gone through that and at times wonder if we're done with that. Yeah. Jesus went through all as a man. Uh, does your view of Jesus include room for Luke 2, verses 40 and 52? Uh, the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Uh, 252, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Those are some things to consider. I don't pretend that we're going to answer that in its fullness at all. And in fact, to end the introduction, this is my final admission. I am sure that I have missed some aspects of this subject. I know that this presentation will not be, uh, to use the word, exhaustive in its scope. And I hope that when I'm done that you will not say that it was rather exhausting. So I want you to stay with me on this as we, I know it's afternoon. If you need to get up and pace around in the back, it's not going to bother me. Just don't leave. Uh, let's begin. There are four basic movements to the message this afternoon. Uh, we're going to deal with them in order. They will overlap and flow into one another. So I want you to, to watch for those. I'll try and bring them to your attention so you can see where we're at in this. The first one is this. There are a handful of direct statements in Scripture regarding the Spirit's ministry to Christ. Defining that as narrowly as possible. That's where we have to begin. Uh, just by logic. You have to begin at that point. The most narrow definition of that, there are a handful of places and events in the life of Christ that you could say the Spirit ministered to Him. We will then go from there to see where other texts that give us implications, other texts that, from prophecy that give us insight to it, and then we will come uh, to the end. Let's begin here. This handful of direct statements regarding the Spirit's ministry to Christ. Under this, I have five moments in the life of Christ. Five moments when you can see the Holy Spirit's ministry to him. They are his birth, his baptism, his temptation, his ministry, and his death, crucifixion, and resurrection. It is at those five moments where scripture is very clear in saying what role did this Holy Spirit have in ministering to Jesus? What did the Son receive? And so the first one is very obvious. The first one, very obvious. Matthew 1.18. Uh, this I happen to be reading from the NIV. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, from his very birth, the Holy Spirit is there. That is how he is conceived. There is no earthly father. That's why you have a doctrine called the virgin birth. His origin is not in a man. His origin is in God and this woman yes. together. Yes. And scripture, and somebody talked about its characteristic understatement and veiling of things, just kind of puts a veil over this. And we have mystery about this and we wonder about the, the details and the DNA and all the molecular elements that go into the creation of a, a being. And it just says, she had child through the Holy Spirit. Angel comes and gives her a message, says, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Just gracious 
language. We will go through these and then talk about them again. Uh, second of these five is his baptism. Uh, Matthew 3.16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. So you see this one like a dove, this representation, this Holy Spirit coming down and being upon him. Very visible and obvious at that time. Uh, for me, I don't know if the crowd could see it or if only John could. It doesn't really talk in those kind of details. Uh, by the way, who's that a sign for? John. That's what God said. John, the one you see, the Holy Spirit come and stay on, that's the one. So... I'm just going to tell you right here, it wasn't for Jesus' benefit strictly. Did he, was he blessed by it? No doubt. Did he benefit from it? Yes. But the primary purpose in that sign was to John, not to Jesus. Jesus was not wondering who he was. And then he heard God's voice from heaven. And then, oh, that's who I am. No, no. Uh, third, which follows right on the heels of the baptism. When you're reading through uh, Matthew and Luke, uh, Mark just gives a couple little verses. Right after he's baptized, you have this visible moment where the Spirit is ministered to Christ in this way. And then uh, Mark, even more vividly, says the Spirit drove him into the wilderness or sent him, some will say, or led him, the other Matthew says, to be tempted, in order to be tempted. The Spirit knew what was coming and drove him to the wilderness for this. And so you have uniquely at his temptation this mention of the Spirit. And if you have read your accounts in Matthew 3 and Luke 3 of the actual temptation, you, you don't see the Spirit mentioned there, but how does Jesus respond to the temptations? With Scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. Well, who wrote it? Well, the Spirit did. You see how he's there even though he's not named? And isn't that just like the Holy Spirit? When you read through Scripture, some of you that uh, were trying to get things together, and, and Brother Phil uh, very well mentioning in, in uh, the Timothy 3.16 text, how the Spirit is there. The Spirit is there, though maybe not explicitly stated. Well, you see that all through the Gospels as well. Uh, you'll see that when we get to uh, our second point. Uh, fourth element of the five is his ministry. There are some places where it is uh, very, very uh, specific in mentioning. Let me give you a few of them. Right after uh, baptism, temptation, now Luke 4 verse 1 says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. So you have that mentioned, how the Spirit is there. Uh, Luke 4.14, 4, right after that story that's there, verse 14, right further down the same chapter, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. Uh, Luke 10.21, at that time Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure full of joy through the Holy Spirit. Now those are just some references in the Gospels. What I'm going to challenge you to do is that when you recover from the conference and you have uh, the ability to go to Scripture again, think about Scripture with this in mind. How was the Spirit ministering to Jesus? So when you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when you read what the uh, writers of the epistles were saying about the ministry of Christ, be sensitive to that, and I think you will uncover things that I haven't. I've tried to bring them into a nice package so that we can look at them briefly and, and at least have some recognition of what we've done, some awareness of what progress has been made. But I am, again, confident that there is much more in here on this matter that we aren't even going to touch and maybe not even make reference to that verse. But those uh, few references there are to power and joy in his ministry. And they don't belabor the point. Well, who's writing this again? Oh, the Holy Spirit's writing this. And if the Holy Spirit's writing this, his point and uh, role is not to bring attention to himself anyway. So he is not as some kind of uh, savvy narrator that is inserting himself in the story. And by the way, I'm the Holy Spirit. I'm writing this for you. He just doesn't mention himself at all. He's casting the light upon the sun and glorifying God through that. And so he's all the way in here giving this to us. But the only way 
Well, I won't say the only. The one way we know that is because Scripture says that about itself. And again, thus, Brother Poe's message on the giving of Scripture to mankind, the inspiration of Scripture. The other way that we know it uh, in a very real way is our experience with it. You read this and you know the Spirit has written this because this word cuts through you and divides you asunder and cuts down to the joints and the marrow of you. And so you who have the Spirit within you read this and you have that resonance that occurs there. So we have his birth, his baptism, his temptation. In his ministry, there's power and joy because of the Holy Spirit. And interestingly, uh, in Acts chapter 1, he gives commandment, he gives the orders to his apostles by the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1. So this is even Christ after he has died, been cru after crucifixion, death, resurrection. Afterward, still leaning upon the Holy Spirit, still trusting in his guidance. That's Acts chapter 1. The fifth item of this uh, biography of Christ where you can see the ministry of the Spirit to him is the events of the last week. His crucifixion, death, his resurrection. You have at those moments the Spirit's ministry to him. Again, not real strongly stated, but it is there. Uh, for example, when Jesus died, how does it describe it? It says he gave up the ghost. Well, who, the spirit that Christ had, was it strictly his own? Was not the Holy Spirit in him with, without measure? So when he is giving that up, isn't there an element where the Holy Spirit has left that body? And he, his identity, has left that body. He's no longer in the body. He is gone. So you see an element where he is there at the death. At the resurrection, this is when you see clearly who he is beyond all question, beyond all doubt. Let me give you five things to see alongside these five events. At his birth, at his nativity, what we have is the identity bestowed. Now he is, of course, the Word that was with God, that was God, that was in the beginning with God, everything created by him, not anything created apart from him. But he wasn't Jesus then. He wasn't Jesus then. That's why when you read your Old Testament, it doesn't talk about Jesus. It talks about the Word, or my Redeemer, or my Holy One, or my Servant. And then there comes that point in time and history where the timeless one now is in time. And the one that has no boundary in all of creation now is only in this baby. And that baby can only be at one place at one moment and has all the weaknesses, has to be fed and clothed and cared for by a mother, has to be ministered to. He does not just come out and suddenly is proficient in everything, has to learn how to speak. The, the, the gospels that are out there that try to have stories where Jesus is speaking as a baby, those are, those are false gospels. Those are legendary stories that were written two and three centuries afterward. So if you ever hear this nonsense about these lost gospels, they're not lost. They've always known where they are. They're just no good. And the church fathers knew that and put them away. They weren't lost at all. You were protected from them and from the nonsense. And by the way, if you want to know a little more about that, grammatically they've examined them and the vocabulary and grammar of them is clearly 2nd and 3rd century and has no place in 1st century. So if you want to go a little further with it, they don't belong. That's why they're not in here. And again, you also have the experiential test. You that have the spirit within you, you read them and they rage against your spirit because they don't accurately portray the character of Christ and his Father. So at the birth, you have this element. Today I have begotten thee. Today thou art my son. That bestowal of identity, that ch change, if I can say this, from word to Jesus, God in the flesh, God among us. So you have uniquely identity there. In the second, with baptism, you have at that point his identity revealed. You have here the Spirit comes upon him, this reveals his identity, and if that were not enough, God himself speaks at that moment and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. In his temptation, in his temptation, I love this, I'm excited that I saw this. His identity is tested. Isn't that what the devil does? If thou be the Son of God, all three times. 
All three times. So you have that identity given at his conception, that identity revealed at his baptism, and then immediately tested, immediately tested in the temptation. Throughout his ministry, you have his identity confirmed and practiced. Identity confirmed and practiced. He could so, so say even, believe me for the work's sake. Look at what I'm doing. You know who I am. You know where I'm coming from. His identity throughout his ministry is confirmed and practiced. And in his death and in his resurrection, you have his identity vindicated for all time. You have your scriptures with you. Please turn to the book of Romans. Let's uh, fasten, fa fasten this down so there's no question in your mind about this. Romans chapter 1, Paul begins the letter, and he says in verse 3, Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That is why in that fifth moment in the life of Christ where the Spirit is ministering to him in an unmistakable way, Paul is writing here in Romans, he is how? Declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection of the dead. It's according to the Spirit of holiness as contrast to according to the flesh. So he comes as the seed of David according to the flesh, but he's declared to be the Son of God, not just of David, but the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. And that by the resurrection of the dead. Um, whenever you look at the resurrection, it is the, um, the fastener all the way through. Any argument you develop through scripture, it almost always seems that it's somehow really expanded and highlighted, but, oh, well, and then there's the resurrection. You can make your case through the prophets and so on that Jesus is the Son of God, but ultimately you have to finish it with, well, he was raised from the dead, never to die again. That settles the matter. So you see his identity and its close relationship to the ministry of the Holy Spirit to him. In the baptism, I want to remind you of this again, that when this spirit descends, it is not that Jesus somehow was without the spirit before and that he had to have more of his substance at that time. This is a, a God's identifying of him to John. This is also the beginning of his ministry. Before that, he is a carpenter. It is not needed that he has this moment when he's in the carpentry shop. Though you, you may have uncovered this, some of you that were working on this, very interesting. You know there's an example in the Old Testament of the Spirit giving wisdom to particular people? Amen. Bezalel and Aholiah as they're working on the tabernacle. And it's very, very clearly noted uh, in Exodus that God is giving his spirit to them and showing them how he wants things made. And uh, when I saw that, I wondered if there was any way in which that worked with the carpenter of Nazareth at all, that he somehow was a better craftsman because of that. I, I don't know. Now what I want you to listen for as we go through some of these scriptures, we've talked about the direct statements about the ministry of the Holy Spirit to Christ. Again, just a handful of those. Next, we're going to look at implications from other verses about the Spirit's ministry to Christ. And what you will find is it'll say, this is what the Spirit does, and since you know Jesus had the Spirit, you can rightly conclude that he did that for Jesus, and he was at work in Jesus' life in that way. And you can see the harmony. After that, we will look at some moments of uh, prophecy. Matthew chapter 12, when Matthew cites actually a prophecy here. Matthew 12, Isaiah's prophecy, beginning in verse 18. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles, he will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A battered reed he will not break off, a smoldering wick he will not put out until he leads justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. Do you see how in that description of the Spirit's work in God's servant, 
who is fulfilled in Christ, which is exactly the point Matthew is making, you see somewhat of the Holy Spirit's ministry to Jesus and from Jesus. And you see this, this back and forth. The Spirit is put upon him, and what does he do? Proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So he has to have a ministry of justice to himself before he can share that with the others as well. Uh, the Spirit ministers to him, verse 19, by not being one that cries in the streets, uh, one that does not break the bruised reed, one that does not snuff out the smoldering wick. That was the Spirit's ministry to Jesus in giving him that kind of compassion. As Jesus leaned upon the Spirit, he would follow in this way. Amen. We could read about in Matthew 12 a little later where Jesus says, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And there again you have a revelation of his identity in that he is Lord over even the unseen realm. Not just Lord of nature, not just Lord of humanity, not just Lord over disease, but even the unseen realm, he is Lord over that. In Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4, here Jesus goes to Nazareth. He returns to his hometown, speaking as a man, and he goes into the synagogue, turns to the place in Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. There again, Luke citing this, telling this story, Jesus himself citing a prophecy about what it's saying about him, as he says here, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, and then sits down. Um, you see this Spirit's ministry to him and from him here as well. The Lord, Spirit of the Lord is upon me. What does that Spirit of the Lord prompt him to do? Why has he been anointed? To preach the gospel to the poor. So you see the ministry of the Holy Spirit through him in that way. Sent him to proclaim release to captives, to give sight to the blind, to set free those that are downtrodden. So you see some of that there. John 16, this passage that's been cited in that final discourse of Christ before he is crucified before he's even betrayed, says the spirit of truth, John 16, 13, the spirit of truth, when he comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will disclose to you what is to come. I think it is fair to say that what is implied here when we think about the spirit of truth's ministry to the apostles, that he is giving... To them, this guidance into all truth, this remembrance of everything Jesus has said. What we also have is that the Spirit ministered to Jesus the things from God. And so you would look and see the 1 Corinthians chapter 2 passage that uh, who is the one that searches the deep things of God? It is the Spirit of God. And so how did Jesus have these things? It is the Spirit ministering those things to him. Receiving from God. Jesus said, not my words, not my doctrine, but his and the Spirit is the one that is giving that to Christ. Acts 10 and verse 38. This is a nice summary in the preaching of the apostles uh, on this matter. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. That shows you somewhat of that Holy Spirit's ministry to him and from him. Let me give you some more in terms of implications. Think about what's taught in Romans chapter 8 uh, in terms of prayer and the Spirit ministering to our weakness and interceding for us. Have you ever thought about that in connection to the Lord himself? Yes, not spiritual weakness. I, uh, I understand that Jesus is not sinfully weak in the same ways he doesn't have the experience we have had in that. He has never had to repent, for example, where we do. But Romans 8 isn't talking about sin, per se. It's talking about that longing that you have a spirit from God in this jar of clay, and it's longing and longing and longing. And you don't think that was true of Jesus? He's not specifically stated here, but again, I think this is a fair implication to say, if this has been true of us who have spirit in flesh, then how much more did the spirit assist Christ in these groanings that could not be uttered before the Father?
Galatians 4, 6, as well as places in Romans. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So the spirit of Christ is helping us to call God Father. You could also look at Romans 8, 16, and 17 and conclude that the spirit of God is assisting Christ in calling Abba, Father, and having that ministry to him as well. We could go on and on and talk about issues. In fact, the whole message could have been just about a matter of holiness. Uh, he is the Holy Spirit. Uh, over and over, scriptures talk about uh, sanct salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. The other places, uh, sanctifying work of the Spirit. And we all know that experientially. Uh, any of you that have the Spirit of God dwelling in you know about your heightened sense sensitivity to sin. You know about your conviction over sin and the Spirit ministering that to you. That Spirit ministered in that way to Christ as well. He is the Holy Spirit. Jesus overcame by the power of the Spirit in his life as well. You never see in the Gospels or anywhere else for that matter, Jesus demonstrating that I don't need the Spirit you never see that behavior attitude in Christ. In fact, you always see this dependence upon the Spirit, reliance upon the Spirit, so much so that the Gospel writers will write almost in passing, he did this by the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. He went in the power of the Spirit. You see that dependence all the way through, all the way through. Brother Seth has a sheet out on the table, uh, scriptures on the Holy Spirit, and many of the ones that were on there are ones that were also in my notes in this matter of some of the implications under the second heading. Consider Matthew 10. When Jesus is speaking to his apostles, he says, When they deliver you up, do not become anxious about how or what you will speak, for it shall be given you in that hour what you are to speak. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. This is true of his apostles. This is true of him. That's why he was the way he was, because it was the Spirit speaking through him. He was not relying on his own power, fleshly ability, anything like that. It was a dependence and a reliance upon the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. Yes. Acts 5.32, after the beginning trouble in the early church, uh, Peter, speaking to the council, says, We're witnesses of, the, of these things, so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Peter's applying this to himself and the other apostles. How, how much more is that true of Christ, who is the fullness of obedience? The one who can say without qualification, I always do those things that please my Father. Amen. That is part of how the Spirit is ministering to him. The ministry that, that uh, Brother Kin gave to us on the love of God being poured out in our hearts or shed abroad in our hearts, Romans 5.5. 5. Love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given to us. That's how Jesus was able to be loving. That's how he was able to reach out to the downtrod because the Spirit of God had shed forth love in his heart as well. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus could have the joy when he's going through his ministry. That's why he could abound in hope, Romans 5, 15, 13, because of the Holy Spirit. Consider the passage in Galatians 5 that talks about the fruit of the Spirit and the, the attendant list that is there, love, joy, peace, so forth. Do you have, you, have you ever thought about how Christ perfectly exemplifies the fruit of the Spirit? There's not any one of those characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit you read and say, well, that's sure not describing Jesus. He was one who was full of the Spirit, and so the Spirit's ministry to him is love, joy, peace, patience, temperance, and so forth. And the Spirit's ministry from him demonstrated that in the way he dealt with people as well. Amen. Just a, another, a few brief other ones in, in the implications. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. I realize that the Spirit referred to there may not, in fact, be referring to the Holy Spirit, but Jesus certainly demonstrated power, love, and discipline. There is no way you can read the Gospels and conclude that he was inadequate in any one of those areas. Someone that gets up well before the start of day so that they can pray, one that spends the whole night in prayer, one that fasts for 40 days and 40 nights, discipline. 
that coming by the work of the Holy Spirit. No prophecy ever made by an act of human will, 2 Peter 1.21, New American Standard, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Even Nicodemus says, we know you're a teacher from God. They could see that he was speaking and it was God's authority speaking through him. Why is that? Because he's one of those holy men. Only he is the holiest of men that is speaking as the Spirit carries him along. Now consider some of these prophecies. Isaiah chapter 11, referring to Jesse, the Davidic line. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord, and he will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by what his ears hear. With righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. That last phrase, breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. This is one of whom they said, when he asked them a question, no man dares to ask him any more questions. He's slaying the wicked by the breath of his mouth. He's not arming himself. He's not getting a militia. He's only speaking. And in some cases, only asking a question. And just devastates the enemies. This is fulfilled in the life of Christ. The Spirit of the Lord ministers wisdom to him and from him. The Spirit ministers understanding to him and from him. Counsel, strength, knowledge, all of this to him and from him. You see this demonstrated in the life of Christ. Here's another one, Isaiah 42, the first part of that chapter. Behold my servant whom I uphold, who I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. This is what was fulfilled in the Gospels. Again, you see that the spirit is ministering peace, patience, and forbearance to Jesus. And by the way, he'll do the same for you. Isaiah 44. Listen to this. I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. 44 verse 4. And they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And that one will call in the name of Jacob. And another will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord. And will name Israel's name with honor. This was true of Christ without exception. Yes. That the Spirit's ministry to him is a vindication of his identity over and over again. You see that he belongs to the Lord by what he says, by how he lives, by what he does with his hands. Everything about his life is saying, belonging to the Lord, belonging to the Lord. Yes. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last and there is no God besides me. And you know well from Revelation that in fact Jesus has this said of himself, first and last, alpha and omega. You see this fulfilled and remarkably to me, you see the matter here is identity. Identity. That's what's being ministered here by the Spirit. You belong to the Lord. That's what's being ministered. Isaiah 61, again the first part of the chapter. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. Again, this verse that he had from the synagogue in Nazareth. What is the Spirit doing here? You'll notice that the Spirit of, God, of the Lord God is upon me because it really blesses me or because I really need it. No. No. It's always with a function of ministry. Always spirit upon so that you can function in the ministry. The Lord has anointed him to bring good news. Sent him to bind up the brokenhearted. All the way through, you will see that, and that's what makes this so difficult, because there's no real passage that talks in depth and in detail about the Spirit's ministry to Christ, because always the Spirit is ministering to him so that Christ may minister from the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't you leave thinking at all that all you have to do is go out to some mountainside and ask for the Spirit to fill you so you can live as a hermit on the mountainside. He is not going to do it. He will fill you so that you may do the work of the kingdom. 
He will fill you so your mouth will open and you will sing forth the wonderful works of God. That's what the role of the Spirit is for us, and that was also true of Christ. The ministry to him was so that there can be an effective ministry from him. Amen. Consider this relationship to Christ, the Spirit's ministry to him from Ezekiel 36, verse 26 and 27. We know this one. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you, remove the heart of stone from your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. That's not speaking of Christ. He didn't have that heart of stone that needed removed. We did. He didn't. But look at verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. That's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to Christ. Obedience. Holiness. Walking in the statutes, observing the ordinances of God. Micah chapter 3 verse 8 here the prophet speaking by the spirit has said what the false prophets were like and so now in verse 8 he says on the other hand I am filled with power with the spirit of the Lord and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act even to Israel his sin so what was the spirit's ministry to Micah is to fill him with power and with justice and courage to tell people this is wrong and that same ministry occurred in the ministry of Christ. He receives of the Spirit. He is filled with the Spirit. And he is one who in Matthew 23 lays waste to the Pharisees with his series of woes against their sin. Now some final, some final thoughts. If we stopped right now, this would be an extremely inadequate message. Because we have talked about what it was in the first century. We've talked about how was the ministry to Christ. What was it about for him? You've heard it all along. I don't know if you've made this jump already, so I'm going to assist you in this. You want to know what the Spirit's ministry to Jesus was like? What's his ministry to you? You are a person who is born of flesh and of the Spirit. You are born again. I realize Christ is beyond measure in these elements, but yet in principle we are still his brothers and sisters. We are not some sub-creation. We have flesh. He had flesh. We have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. He had the Spirit of God dwelling in him. So the best way to understand the Holy Spirit's ministry to him is to go through your scripture and fully soak in and realize his ministry to you and you will see application all over the place. Amen. In matters of holiness, in the matters of forbearance, uh, with things that should be difficult and frustrating, Jesus showed this calmness. Why? Because of the Spirit. In matters of what you say and how you testify to others, you have power because the Spirit of God dwells in you. Jesus had power at least because of that as well. The Holy Spirit continually reminds us of our citizenship in heaven. It is He that is in our hearts crying out, Abba, Father. He is the one reminding us of where we really come from, what our last names really are. And he was always having that ministry to Christ all the way through, all the way through. How much more would the Holy Spirit remind the hometown hero, the very son of heaven, of his origin all the way through his ministry, showing him, reminding him where he came from. Again, I, I speak as a man because we speak with weakness. We speak having actually sinned and needing to repent. And so all those things are different between our relationship and Christ's relationship to the Spirit. So I, I will acknowledge that it is not a precise one-to-one -one correspondence. We do have differences, a clear difference in that. The Holy Spirit did not have to minister to Christ and convict him of his sin. But he ministers that way to us. The Spirit will minister to us, at least in some way, similar to the way he ministered to the Lord. Amen. We're disciples, aren't we? We're not above our Master. It is enough for us to be as our Master. And so as we grow in his likeness, we will grow in our awareness of the Spirit's availability, of his great eagerness and desire to take hold of us. And so that we would know with Paul why we have been apprehended, that we would apprehend ourselves the fullness of why God has taken hold of us in the Holy Spirit. We have yet to see 
we have yet to see how fully the Holy Spirit can minister to us. We have as our model his ministry to Christ because Jesus is the pinnacle where spirit and man meet. Thank you.